Good evening, Save to Serve International, and all of those of you who are joining us this evening. Thank you for joining us for this prophetic insights. One more evening to study God's Word, to look at current events, both in the world and in the church, and how we may be prepared to be God's messengers in these last days and be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So at this time, let's all bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, as we begin our lesson this evening, you have promised to be our teacher. Teach us now. Guide us into all truth is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Events in the world and in the church indicate clearly that the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is but moments away. Events are taking place that are putting things in motion to bring about the mark of the beast crisis. And we know that before Jesus comes, that the crisis must take place, as well as the shaking among God's people, as well as the falling away. Also, we know that the giving of the loud cry message must be given to the world. And we see steps now being taken to bring about the mark of the beast crisis, but we also see on the other hand that the Lord is preparing the hearts of individuals around the world to receive the final message, the final message, the loud cry message of the third angel. A recent study was taken, a poll was taken in North America, which showed that individuals were that the membership in Protestant churches, the Orthodox ones, were uh, increasing significantly. While the same study showed that the membership was rapidly declining with their liberal counterparts. Now let's take a look at the actual news report that confirms what you have just shared. This is from Catholic Herald, December 14th, 2016. The headline reads, liberal churches in decline while orthodox ones grow. It says here, a study of Protestant churches in Canada has found that growing churches tend to be more orthodox while shrinking ones are theologically liberal. Think about that. It says, the researchers looked at 22 mainline Protestant churches in Canada. Nine of the churches were growing in attendance, while 13 were declining. The researchers found that when other factors were controlled for, the theological conservatism of both attendees and clergy emerged as important factors in predicting church growth. In growing congregations, all the clergy interviewed said it was crucial to encourage non-Christians to convert. Don't forget that. In declining churches, only half the clergy agreed. The study found that in growing churches, pastors were even more orthodox than their congregations. Hmm. In declining ones, the pastors were even more liberal. Hmm. Hmm. It says, growing congregations were likely to be younger and have more children. Haskell told Mattingly, if you believe that Jesus is the path to the best life in this life and eternal life in the next, then you are going to practice your faith differently than someone who believes that all religions hmm. are basically the same. It, it ends by saying, and it turns out doctrines really do have consequences. Now, what stood out to you from this here? This is very interesting because it seems as though the churches that are teaching doctrines, Bible doctrines, are the ones that are growing. So it's showing that there's a hungering, there's a longing for something more. You know, with the liberal churches, uh, 
individuals are realizing that it's not satisfying them. It's not fulfilling. And so they want to go to the places where there are standards, where Bible truths are being, uh, being taught from the pulpit. Now, there is a similar research that was done within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Very similar to this one. And there were similar results. And one conclusion was, from this research done in Seventh-day Adventism, was that the majority of the churches within this denomination, specifically in North America, have been seeing a decline in church membership. Mm -hmm. Look at this to confirm. I wonder what is causing this. Look at this here. This is uh, the Adventist News Network. What is the headline here, Hillary? Membership nears 18 million. Secretary highlights regions of growth decline. Now look at this. It says, this is from Christianity Today, reporting on the Seventh-day Adventist research that was done. It says, Adventists, headline, assess why one in three members leave the church. Mm. One in every three members leave the church. And then a tagline reads, why does the worldwide denomination of Seventh-day Adventists lose 43 people for every 100 it converts? The mm. question. And then they wrote, hint, it's not doctrine. Yet what we're going to see, that doctrine indeed is playing a major significant role that is causing many of the churches within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, specifically in North America, not excluding churches in other regions, why people are leaving the church. Now, there is a conference president here in Florida, Mike Cawley. He was a part of, of this research, and he gave this conclusion. Look at what it says here. This is uh, Mike Hawley and his finding from this research done within the Seventh-day Adventist Church about the declining of church membership. Hillary? A close look today at the Adventist Church in North America reveals that the church is in need of deep change if it is going to remain viable, in accomplishing its mission, especially in reaching people under age 40, now and as they grow older. Here are some of the reasons that I feel this way. One, studies indicate that we are losing 40 to 45 percent of those we baptize. Two, research in South Florida shows that we are losing 60 to 70 percent of our young mm. people in immigrant churches, Latin and Caribbean, after high school. We are not retaining our youth in those congregations. Mm. Three, there are very few African-American churches in some regional conferences. The work is being sustained only by the influx of our Caribbean members and converts, but we are not reaching indigenous black Americans. Four, many of the Caucasian members in NAD are older. Younger white families are conspicuously absent. I believe God is calling us to face the challenge and talk about right, it. Right. You know, let's get back to this. Mm -hmm. Because this session this evening is entitled Diagnosing, a diagnosis of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's spiritual declension. And in order for us to appreciate the remedy, the solutions mm -hmm. from the Word of God, we have to first acknowledge that truly there is a spiritual declension within the churches of Seventh-day Adventism. Now, Pastor, are you saying that this spiritual declension is connected to the numerical declension? Is that yes. what we're saying? Because yes. th these researches that we have shown from the beginning up into the present are primarily dealing with uh, the numerical declension in membership, numbers-wise. Now... The question that we must ask, why is it that the churches within Seventh-day Adventism 
are experiencing a membership decline. What's causing this? Mm -hmm. And what we have discovered in our research is that the majority of the pastors within Seventh-day Adventism in these churches, conferences, that are presently experiencing membership decline have introduced worldliness into the churches. Yes. Carnival-like music, mm -hmm. the new theology, the counterfeit gospel. The emerging church movement. Yes. Mm -hmm. And also drama and skits, plays. Games, socials. Entertainment. Right. And as a result, we are now seeing a membership decline within these Seventh-day Adventist churches. Mm -hmm. And these pastors believed that by introducing worldliness, entertainment, having a social club atmosphere at their churches, right. a carnival-like service and worship services, emotionalism, mm -hmm, etc. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That this would bring about an increase of membership in their churches. And as a result, having an increase of tithes and offerings in the plates. Now, we must say that they were right to some extent. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for a couple of decades, the Seventh-day Adventist church has experienced a boom in church membership. Almost every year, they were boasting, you know, 15 million strong Adventists worldwide, mm -hmm. 16 million, 17 million worldwide. Now it's 18 million. But now we are seeing from these researches recently that now they're seeing a membership decline. Right. But think about it. Why wouldn't it be if people are coming to the Seventh-day Adventist church and they're realizing the thing that they left over in Babylon is the same environment that they're in in these professed Seventh-day Adventist churches, what's the difference? Some of them may even go back to those churches or want nothing to do with Christianity because it's no longer based on a thus saith the Lord. It's about feelings. And not only are, are we now seeing a membership decline numerically right. within the churches of Seventh-day Adventism, specifically North America, again, not excluding other regions of the sure, world. Sure. But we're also seeing a spiritual decline in the members. Again, not only in those who have left the churches, mm -hmm. but a spiritual declension among members who remain in these churches. Now, look at these statements here. I'm quoting here from the book Great Controversy, Page 384, it says, what was the origin of the great apostasy? How did the church first depart from the simplicity of the gospel? By conforming to the practices of paganism, to facilitate the acceptance of Christianity by the heathen. Mm. During the lives of the apostles, the church remained comparatively pure. But toward the latter end of the second century, most of the churches assumed a new form. The first simplicity disappeared. And insensibly, as the old disciples retired to their graves, their children, along with new converts, came forward and new modeled the cause. Here it is now. To secure converts, the exalted standard of the Christian faith was lowered. And as a result, a pagan flood flowing into the church carried with it its customs, practices, and idols. Hmm. Has not the same process been repeated in nearly every church calling itself Protestant? Wow. Is this not a startling statement? Yes. Now, right. read this one from Great Controversy, page 509. Conformity to worldly customs converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. Familiarity with sin will inevitably cause it to appear less repulsive. He who chooses to associate with the servants of Satan will soon cease to fear their master. You can stop right there. So it says here, conformity to world of customs converts the church to where? To the world. It never converts 
the world to Christ. Christ. So while they were experiencing a boom in church membership by implementing worldly methods and doctrines, now they're seeing a decline, a rapid decline in church membership. That's correct. And as you mentioned, you know, they, they did. You know, it seemed as though for a time those methods that they introduced were successful. But by and by, they saw that it wasn't. So we're seeing here that these methods are much like the effect of stimulants upon the body. Mm. A stimulant will a stimulant. raise you. Mm. Yes, a stimulant will give you this false high, this mm -hmm. false excitement. And so it is when they brought in these worldly method, methods, it would give the, the members a, a worldly uh, a high, mm. so to speak. But then after the high is gone, there's emptiness, there's depression, there's suicidal thoughts. And when you think about the effects of stimulant, it really affects uh, the frontal lobe. It impairs the reasoning. It impairs the judgment. And so it was with the members. So it was with the churches. It, it's like the church uh, took these stimulants, these worldly methods, as it were. But now we're seeing the results. Once that high wears off, we're seeing the other side of it. We're seeing the low. They're dropped even lower than before they even introduced these worldly methods. You know, friends, as we are seeing the boom and the bust, and I hope you're following us this evening, the boom and the bust, this great influx of members within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, and then a significant decline in church membership. As it is seen in the churches, it's also seen in the schools. Do you know the Seventh-day Adventist denomination boasts to have the largest Protestant denomination school system worldwide? Wow. Second to Popery, the Roman Catholic Church school system. Hmm. And what I'm going to share with you right now from the research we have done a couple of decades ago within the Seventh-day Adventist school system, school system now, not churches, mm -hmm. school system, there was an increase of student enrollment, a boom. Right. But now we are seeing student enrollment decline, right. nosedive within the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Sure. And to such a point that some schools are even having to close their doors. What's causing this? Right. Did God not as call for the establishment of a true educational system? So why are we seeing boom and bust? Why? Schools closing within Adventism. Why? We have to diagnose the spiritual declension in the church and in the schools. Look at this carefully here. Now, I see individuals sending in their comments on Facebook or on, on Twitter, on Twitter already. Later on in the segment, we will take your feedback, your questions, your comments. Just go to uh, the Twitter or Twitter page using the hashtag STS Live. Look at this carefully. This is uh, Adventist News Network. It says this, Ted Wilson, well, let's skip on down, October 8th, 2016. Ted Wilson said, Adventist educators must not forget to seek the Lord, even as they prosper as employees of the world's largest Protestant educational system of more than 8,200 schools and 10,000, pardon me, 100,000 teachers. Wow. Then from Ministry Magazine, it says, in fact, the Adventists maintain the largest worldwide private school system next to that maintained by the Roman Catholic Church. Wow. Now look at this carefully now. Mm -hmm. This is Adventist today. Friends, we're seeing a crisis within Adventism. It says right here, Adventist today, January 15, 2015, Ohio conference delegates did what? 
Vote to Vote close. Vote to close. Mount Vernon. Mount Academy. Vernon Academy. Let's move on. This is January 7th, 2016. Adventist Review. It says Oakwood cuts 46 jobs as Adventist enrollment declines across where? The US. Across the United States of America. Hmm. So we're seeing here this system, school, uh, scholastic system, Adventism, school system, right. experience a boom. So much so, it was the largest private school system worldwide within the Protestant denomination. What are they now experiencing, Hillary? A, a decline. decline. A I rapid wonder, decline. I wonder why. Mm -hmm. Look at this here. This is just a few days ago, December 6th, 2016. Breaking news. Heather Knight announces the end of her Pacific Union College presidency. And they stated one reason why she must have resigned. Tagline, skip one down, it says, the last two years at Pacific Union College have seen enrollment decline. Right. And as a result, the college has struggled to meet its, its budget. budget. But you know, when you think of PUC, that's one of the most, more, one of the more liberal universities within uh, yes. Seventh-day Adventism. Yes. And so we're seeing the, the research that we opened up with from the world showing that the decline was happening in these liberal institute, these liberal churches. We're seeing in the school system of Seventh Day Adventism that there's a, an exodus, as it were, a mass exodus or a drop in enrollment in the liberal uh, school system. So we have to diagnose, as we said before, the reasons why. Boston Globe, look at this. Boston Globe, September seventh, two thousand and eleven. Headline reads from the Boston Globe. College drops out. Tagline, cash woes, loss of accreditation, doom Atlantic Union College. Look at this here. This is from the telegram.com. It says, headline, doctrine disagreement ends Atlantic Union College accreditation bid. And AUC, Atlantic Union College, had to close its doors for a couple of years. Why? Because they, ref they, they, they did not receive accreditation from the world. That means they had to close their doors. A significant drop in student enrollment. They had to close their doors. Why? Because they were seeking accreditation from the world. But what did God say about us Seventh-day Adventists? going to the world to seek worldly accreditation. We should in no way be linked with the world. Our, our institutions, our educational system, and every institution under Seventh-day Adventism, under the name Seventh-day Adventism, should not be connected with the government. Friends, before Churches, I, schools, publishing houses, etc. I'm sorry. Before I read this paragraph here, mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to dig in the books. Last week, we mentioned that book called The Broken Blueprint. We'll come back to that. But the testimonies for the church from Sister White, the book called Volume 5, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6 and Volume 7 and Volume 8, those four books in the testimonies largely deal with our educational system. It says here, back to the screen, it says, a plan to accredit. Atlantic Union College with a National Christian College Association has fallen through. Why? Because of a disagreement about a religious tenet. In its biblical standards section, it says the manual of this board to accredit institutions, the manual requires prospective applicants to adhere to the belief in the existence of Satan as a personal, malevolent being who acts as tempter and accuser for whom the place of eternal, the place of eternal punishment was prepared where all who die outside of Christ 
shall be confined in conscious torment for eternity. Hmm. Adventist doctrine is not in agreement with eternal torment for those who reject God or Christ. Based on that, we, the Atlantic Union College, we would not continue with the application. And friends, over here, they had to close their doors. This was a sign. God, is, God was sending, why go to the world to seek accreditation? Right, and that's what I was going to say. This should have been a wake-up call, but what did they do thereafter? They went and sought it from elsewhere, and, yes. they, and they attained the accreditation that they sought. So they didn't take this as a warning. They didn't get back to God's blueprint. They went ahead with what they wanted to do and got the accreditation from the world that they wanted. So now we have to ask ourselves the question, why is it that there is a marked, rapid membership decline? Look at this here. This is uh, the Sentinel Enterprise. What is the headline here, Hillary? What it says here? Devil in the details for Atlantic Union College's accreditation attempt. And yet, our schools are still going to the world, asking the world to bless them. Right. But, but what can you expect when the denomination, the church side now, is linked with the government as well? 501c3. Right. So, so, so now we're seeing, friends, we have to ask ourselves this question. Why is it that there is a rapid decline in membership within the Seventh-day Adventist churches? Could it be providential? Let that sink in. Could it be providential? Because I believe that one reason why there is a rapid decline of church membership within the Seventh-day Adventist churches is because there's a class of people who are waking up. They realize that their local pastors, elders, are not preparing them and their children to live victorious lives over sin daily. To meet and to overcome the daily crises that they encounter. They are waking up, Hillary. Friends online, they realize that these pastors in the conference churches, they are playing games with the gospel. They're serving moldy bread. They are, they are allowing the people to eat from Jezebel's table. Right. Instead of partaking from heaven's bakery, the loaves from God's table. And as they're reading the testimonies, they're realizing that the church of today is not the Seventh-day Adventist church that got movement, rather, that God established after 1844, doctrinally or um, the, the atmosphere in these churches. And they realize that these pastors, they aren't preaching present truth. No. They are not preparing them as parents and their children and their family members to meet the close approbation, to stand before a holy God without a mediator when Jesus steps out from between the Father and mankind as an intercessor and sins are going to be blotted out. They realize these ministers are not preparing them for the soon appearing of Christ. And they're waking up and they're leaving these apostate Seventh-day Adventist churches. And many of them are now attending self-supporting churches. Many, probably online, now can attest to this. Many of them are now attending home churches or conducting home churches. They no longer return to their local conference churches. So now, when the census is taken in the conference churches, when the tally is made, what will they then see? A decline in church membership. Let me tell you something, friends. The researchers of those reports we have read earlier, they gave every other plausible reason for the spiritual declension. Oh, pardon me. Numerical. The numerical membership numbers, the population, the numerical declension of its membership, but they are afraid to identify. One of the main reasons why there is a numerical 
membership declension in the church. People are waking up right. now. Are mm -hmm. we saying every self-supporting church is of God? Uh, are we saying every home church is of God? We're not saying that. But people are waking up. Sure. They would rather go to a self-supporting church, a ho rather staying home, mm -hmm. than sit in a place where apostasy is being promoted. Right. Go ahead. I was going to say, and as they sit in those environments, they realize that they're not growing spiritually, but they are declining spiritually. And so why stay in a place where they are not growing, where they are not uh, being given the tools to get victory over sin and to be prepared for the soon coming of Jesus Christ? And the sad thing is that <clears throat> once uh, individuals leave the church because they're fed up because of the apostasy and the doctrines from Babylon mm -hmm. being preached from the pulpit and being uh, handed out in the Sabbath school lessons, etc., and the music from Babylon and so forth, the celebration and all of, all of these apostasies that have come in, uh, they don't consider them members anymore, even though they may leave and they're still holding to the historical doctrines Excellent. of Seventh-day Adventism. Excellent. They, they say, well, you've left the church. You're an offshoot. You're no longer, you can't use the name Seventh-day Adventist. You're not a Seventh-day Adventist. When in actuality, they're more of a Seventh-day Adventist because they're going according to what it was when it was established by God. Are we not saying some leave the churches and go into the world? We're saying that. Some do. Absolutely. But we, a lot do. But exactly. Mm -hmm. But the research didn't account for this class, this group, who leave because of apostasies. Right. And, and not remain faithful to the testimony of Jesus and the commandments of God. Sorry. And now we're seeing the same in the schools. Yes, we are. We're, we are? Yes. Okay, what are we seeing? Well, we're seeing that people are fed up. People are thinking that by going to the schools, and we delved deep into this last week. If you haven't seen yes. the presentation last week, you can go on uh, YouTube and you can uh, view it there. But we diagnosed what was happening in the school system and the reason for uh, the, the apostasy that's taking place in the school. And we attribute it to the historical critical method. But individuals, as you said, are waking up. They're realizing that when they send their students to these so-called Seventh-day Adventist schools, they're not receiving a Seventh-day Adventist education. The same practices that have been brought into the church with the dramas, the plays, the, the excitement and so forth, the false theology and so on, uh, these things are taking place in the school and they're fed up and they're saying why should I go in debt and pay these exorbitant amounts of money take out all kind of loans you know to receive what I thought would have been an Adventist education when I could just go to a community college or elsewhere and get the same teachings it's sad our educational systems are no longer teaching historic Seventh-day Adventism. They've gotten rid of the spirit of prophecy and they're bringing in all kind of other books and all kind of other philosophies and um, teachings. And the churches and the schools were established by God to also educate and train end-time missionaries, right. end-time workers. So my question is again, friends, because we're going to answer it now. My question is, could it be that the membership declension within the Seventh-day Adventist churches and the student enrollment declension within the Seventh-day Adventist schools, could it be providential? Is it caused also by God? Is God allowing his sincere individuals and sincere young people not to attend these churches, not to attend these schools, so that they would not be tainted and corrupted? Could it be? Look at this statement here. This is uh, Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page uh, 370 and 371. Hillary, read that for us. If the members of our churches disregard the light on this subject, they will reap the sure result in both spiritual and physical degeneracy. And the influence of these older church members will leaven those newly come to the faith. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth mm. because of the church members who have never been converted and those who were once converted but who have backslidden. What influence would these unconsecrated members have on new converts? Would they not make of no effect the God-given message which his people are to bear? Friends, that statement is so clear. Again, could it be providential? 
It is. When there is a church membership declension and a student enrollment declension among the schools, God does not now work to bring right. many into our churches, many into our schools. Why? These unconverted preachers, elders, professors will corrupt their minds and lives. That's right. And the sad reality is you have Elder Ted Wilson, Elder NG, and the rest. They will talk about, oh, we are growing 18 million strong. Yet the research shows one in every three in South Florida, in the regional conferences, it says 60, pardon me, 45 to 50 percent. That means one in every two persons they baptize leave the church. Right. And they refuse to realize that the membership declension at the root of it is a lack of consecration in leadership and among the people. Right. And the spiritual declension is uh, is connected with the uh, the membership declension as well. And when we bring forward these researches and talk about these things on prophetic insights, the easiest thing the critics will say, there you go, bash in the church, friends, we are here to diagnose. Because unless we diagnose, you're not going to appreciate the solutions, the remedy. Look at this statement here. This is a manuscript releases, a book, uh, volume 12, 333. It says, now those who have had years in this same experience know not God, nor Jesus Christ whom he has sent, and should such go forth as what? Representatives of Christ Jesus, mm -hmm. these men will never give the right mold to other minds. Hmm. They have not grown up to the full stature of men and women in Christ. They simply have the name of Christians, but are not fitted for the work of God and never will be until they are born, born again. again and learn the ABC in true religion of Jesus Christ. Then God says to Sister White, there is a little hope in one direction. Here it is. Here is the remedy now. Here's the remedy, one of the remedies. It says, take, Hillary, read that first. Take whom? Take the young men and women and place them where they will come as little in contact with our churches as possible that the low grade of piety which is current in this day shall not leaven their ideas of what it means to be a Christian. So I want to say mm. even if there's an influx of people coming in under this false movement, this new theology and this new organization as it were, even if there are people that come in, that does not mean that they're converted. Yes. They are coming yes. in under a new yes. organization, as it were. They're not coming into historical Seventh-day Adventism, so they're not converted. They're not really educated in the principles of Christ, the principles of godliness, the principles of reform, et cetera, et cetera. They don't know what it means to be a Seventh-day Adventist. Let's dig into some, some specific things. What are these specific things that pastors and professors, administrators, have introduced into Seventh-day Adventism, churches and schools. And as a result, we have seen a boom in church membership, a boom in student enrollment. But now we are seeing a decline. Right. Number one, what we're seeing here is that the pastors have introduced false doctrines, a new revival, modern revival among the people in the churches and in the schools. And to confirm this, go back to the screen here. Here we have the original document we began with. Look at the last phrase, which shows why the churches that were seen to be growing numerically. One thing caused this, they said, is that because the pastors, they preached doctrines. Hmm. Over here, friends, doctrines. So now they're saying the churches that were stunted in growth, the nominal, the liberal churches, right. 
One reason was the pastors refused to preach Bible doctrines. Hmm. Just love. Right. Just believe. Are we seeing the same thing within Seventh-day Adventism? Sadly, we are. Look at this. Mm -hmm. This is from Spectrum. Just a few weeks ago, September 27th, 2016, it says here, Retired Associate Director of the Ellen G. White Estate at the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, Cindy Tuch, stated, Regarding the One Project movement, Alex Bryan and the rest, Sam Leonore, she wrote the following, I have been to the One Project three times. Mm. Let that sink in. Three times. Mm -hmm. And then she lists what she observed and what she didn't hear, uh, taught, or even emphasize. She right. says, what I miss, there was no positive references to the following. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14. The concept of a remnant raised up by Christ for a specific purpose in time. Creation in seven literal, contiguous, 24-hour periods. An act of God which precedes predation. Ellen White's book, The Great Controversy. These things were omitted. The pre-advent judgment. A Christ whose overwhelming grace inspires holiness mm -hmm. in lifestyle and affects our choices in dress. So no dress reform is taught there. Mm -hmm. No victory over sin is taught there. Over food and drink, entertainment and sexuality. sexuality. And the prophetic portions of Daniel and the Revelation, these things are not taught, not mentioned, not emphasized. Mm -hmm. And yet, many of the conferences... They invite the preachers from the One Project to go to Pathfinder Camperies, youth revivals, mm -hmm. camp meetings, um, convocations, saying that this method is what is going to grow the churches. Yes, there was just a he said go missions and one of the prominent speakers from One uh, Project was one of the speakers there. And, yes, and notice again, and that was for the NAD, right. the North American Division. Correct. He said go. And yet they're using these methods. Right. A de-emphasis of doctrine, Bible truth, the three angels' message. Messages. God doth not now work to bring many in those churches. Look at this, or into the truth. It mm -hmm. says here, right here on the screen we have uh, from Spectrum article, Jesus full stop. Because they believe all you must preach is just Jesus. Don't talk about prophecy. Don't talk about Daniel and the Revelation. It's right there on the screen. Right. And then it says right here in full bold relief, Jesus, full stop, just preach Christ and nothing more. And I was going to say, if you do preach Christ, you're going to bring in prophecy. You're going to bring in Daniel and Revelation. If you preach Christ, you're going to bring in victory over sin. So the Christ they're preaching is not the Christ of the Bible. It's a, it's a false Christ. Now, before we go down to number two, I see your comments coming in. Let's take one here. Mm -hmm. I see Kenny Armstrong. He states, preacher, are we there? He states, as an insider, Kenny says, I know that, quote unquote, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. This study is spot on. <laughs> Kenny, thank you so much. Praise the Lord. And then we have, let's take a few more here, lest we are overwhelmed at the end. Mm -hmm. Here we have here, uh, Deborah Ibarra. She says, now at Sabbath school, they do dramatizing. Right. And of course, she doesn't like that. All right? right? These things are happening in the churches. All right? And the schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have Ryan. He says, all this boasting is just to puff up the chest of the GC. And there is no focus to bring people to God. Wow. We're seeing it. Anything, Hillary? Any points? And then we're seeing here, someone says uh, uh, here, 
Sonny John, it says uh, some members feel betrayed because of the difference between the crusade present day sermons mm. versus the watered down sermons in the church. In other words, when they came in, right. they brought in this evangelist and he preached Bible truth. Mm -hmm. And once they were brought into some of or the majority of these churches, all of a sudden, it's the watered down Mary had a little lamb messages. Right. Well, another method uh, that we're seeing that has been employed and is currently being employed in Seventh-day Adventist churches and the school system is bringing in preachers from Babylon, preachers from the world. This is nothing new. This has been taking place for decades, as we've said before, and this has become the norm. We have the Willow Creek uh, involvement of Seventh-day Adventist churches. Uh, even this past year, you had several Seventh-day Adventist churches holding as hosting sites, downlinking uh, the Willow Creek Summit, some of them sending representatives to the actual uh, summit itself. Then you have the PELC, um, Pastoral Evangelism Leadership Council, which is held annually at Oakwood University every single year. And we went there. And even before that, it predates our going there. But every year they bring in at least two or three Sunday uh, preachers from Babylon. And this is a pastoral evangelism leadership council. So what are these men from Babylon teaching Seventh-day Adventist pastors? They're teaching them the very methods that we exposed uh, to bring in, you know, this excitement, bring in the worldly music, bring in the drums, et cetera, et cetera, to grow your church. And they're sitting at the feet of these men that are serving them the wine of Babylon. Yes. Yeah. Now, write down, friends, write down the book, The Great Controversy, page 471, GC 471, that this method of just preach about Jesus no doctrines, no standards. The world did a research. We, sh we showed you the result. Those who don't preach biblical doctrines, their churches eventually die. And we're told in GC 471 that this is a false sanctification. It leads to damnation. Go read that. Look at the screen here. This is, again, from the research that we began with. It says at the very bottom, showing those churches that began to decline numerically is because the members and pastors believe all churches are the same. Ecumenical movement. It's an ecumenical right. movement over here. So all the churches that signed up and signed on to the ecumenical movement, those churches die. Look wow. at this. It says, um, Haskell told Mattingly, if you believe that Jesus is the path to the best life in this life and eternal life in the next, then you are going to practice your faith differently than someone who believes that all religions are basically the same. Right. And as it turns out, doctrines really do have consequences. I wanted to go back to that because you said those churches die that are um, that basically don't have any more distinction. Yes. And I'm, I'm reminded of a statement in Great Controversy, page 445 as well, that talks about uh, there's no difference in doctrine. So we would encourage you to read that as well. But the reason they die is because if you become a part of this uh, am amalgamation of churches, you are no longer an individual church. You're a part of this community, one church as it were. So you, I, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but you no longer have an identity. You're one of them. So you die. Your individual individuality dies. You're now a part of a larger group with no doctrines, no distinctiveness, no peculiarity. And that's what's taking place. May I add? Mm -hmm. Could it be? If we all are the same, all denominations, all religions, then why do evangelism? Right. So what yeah. happens then? You're just brought into one. You, your your growth uh, is stunted. And here we have it on the screen. Bringing in the men from Babylon to teach us. Churches die when they do this. Willow Creek. And of course, you mentioned the, the PLC. Now, I want to bring to your mind a video that was done by the One Project Group. 
Alex Bryan, the chief pastor, made, made some startling, eye-opening, dangerous statements in that video. And I want to share it, come back, and we are going to analyze what he said. Listen carefully to every word. Listen to how the serpent was speaking through Alex Bryan. Watch carefully. Let's play that video. Dwayne. Is it possible that we are a good denomination, but not a great one, because we struggle with this question of identity? Who are we? Is there a new direction? Is it possible that we could have an alternative future? I believe the answer is yes. But it requires setting aside the old historic question, who are we? And asking a brand new question. I have done something naughty. I have mixed three 1,000 piece puzzles all together in this mixing bowl. Now, Imagine for me that the piece I now hold in my hand is part of the image we want to create. And this is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Please hear me. It has a particular shape. It has a unique contribution. It has a special gift that it must give the image of Jesus. But it is only one piece. You see, God has never given the totality of his image to just one gender or just one skin color or just one ethnicity or just one historical time period or just one group of people or just one movement or just one church. You know, friends, mm, 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 mm. what more can be said? that gross apostasy and false doctrines we have just heard, that God never had a true church in each dispensation. He never had a true movement. He's throwing away Revelation 14, verses 6, 7, well, 6 through 12. All of the three angels he's throwing away. That's ecumenism. Mm -hmm. That right. God never gave his, his full identity to one church? How could he say that? And still, he is looked upon as a Seventh-day Adventist. And saying... He's connected with the school and the church because he's the uh, pastor of the Walla Walla, uh, the Walla Walla Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that's the school that the, or the church that the, many of the students that attend Walla Walla University go. And now we are seeing him call for a new direction. What is this new direction? Did God tell us that ministers will stand in our pulpits with, with false doctrines? The hellish, kindled yes, from the hellish torch of Satan? Satan. That's testimonies to ministers. Page 409 and page 410. Alex Bryan in that video is calling for a new organization. Look at this statement here on the screen. This is selected messages. Book 1, page 204, it says, The enemy of souls has sought to bring in the supposition that a great reformation was to take place among Seventh-day Adventists, that this reformation would consist in giving up the doctrines which stand as the pillars of our faith and engaging in a process of reorganization. Were this reformation to take place, what would result Listen to this. The principles of truth that God in his wisdom has given to the remnant church would be discarded. Our religion would be changed. The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. Wow. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. 
A system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced. The founders, look at the boom and the bust. The founders of this system, the new organization, would go into the cities and do what? A, A wonderful, wonderful work. work. The boom. Do you see it now? Mm -hmm. But now watch. The Sabbath, of course, would be what? Lightly, Lightly regarded. regarded. As also the God who created it. Nothing would be allowed to stand in the way of the new movement. Mm. The founders, their, found, their foundation would be built on the sand and storm and tempest would sweep away the structure. We have to diagnose that there is a spiritual declension among Seventh-day Adventism. We must accept it and then also now say, dear God, what are the solutions what are the remedies that's right and it's interesting that it just speaks of these books of the new order that are written so not only do we have books coming in because we mentioned a previous point about the preachers of babylon coming in and educating falsely educating serving their uh wine their false doctrine to seventh day adventist pastors and members but we also see that the books from Babylon are being served and given to the members as well. And not only the books from Babylon, Babylonian authors, but the teaching teachings of Babylonians in books written even by Seventh-day Adventists. Exactly. You have the same philosophies and the same, yes. uh, uh, you know, errors, gross errors and heresies being taught in books and they're being pushed in, you know, Adventist book centers etc and not only that we're also seeing the sports the games the entertainment and friends they believe the more socials they have the more entertaining and, and entertainment they have the video games the domino playing the card games and the monopoly games being played the board games the more of this they have the basketball tournaments olympics in the churches even at the schools, the more of these excitement things they have, they are going to experience an increase of church membership, increase of student enrollment. But what we are now seeing, the end result of all this excitement is a bust. Spiritual declension, right. numerical de declension among God's people. It's backfiring on them. We're also seeing as they think. You know, friends, think about this. Look at some of our nominal Seventh-day Adventist churches. I don't find joy in these things, friends. But the truth must be told. Look at most of our, all of our nominal Adventist churches. When they talk about, let's do a revival, some form of uh, cruise, uh, evangelistic project, who do they invite for their singing evangelist or singing evangelists? Who do they invite to come in the churches, under these tents, talking about they are the praise team? Mm -hmm. These are men and women from Babylon. Right. These are, and also we have Adventists who sing their songs. Right, and, and use their beats and dress like them. And they think by doing this, it's going to increase the attendance at these meetings. But we are seeing the world is telling us those methods end in utter destruction. God is telling us those methods are unconsecrated. They are unsanctified. Look at this. Yes, I was go ahead. just going to say people are seeing that they don't need to go to a church to receive this worldly music why even go to a church why not just stay out in the world if i want to if they want to dance they're going to go to the club they don't need to come to a seventh day adventist church to receive the very thing that they can receive in the world what's the point point? and what you we know? see here is that most people in the world they realize it's just the music and they come just for the music. It's a stimulant. As we said, we made the analogy before. It's a stimulant, a false high, a false sense of excitement that leaves you utterly empty and depleted of everything. So you mean we have GMO Bibles in the church? We have GMO doctrines in the church, Adventism. Oh, yes. And now we have a, a stimulant drink, 
a stimulating drink. Yes. The wine of Babylon. Right. Friends, I want to tell you something. What I'm now seeing, even when Adventists are brought in as singing evangelist praise team, they have to try to outdo their counterparts mm. in Babylon. So they shout louder. Right. They dress more revealing. Put the jewelry on. Dye because their hair. They it's a stimulant. Right. You see, they have to outdo their counterparts in Babylon to have church growth. And we say, oh, the church was packed today, but the people are dying spiritually. That's now, right. I'm going to read a shocking statement for you mm. because I've heard many people say, even when they play the demonic music, as long as we go inside there as preachers and preach present truth, it will have an effect. Listen to what God says. Look at the screen here. This is Selected Messages, book two, page 36 and page 37. Hang on to every word. It says this, the things you have described, the things you have described as taking place in Indiana, the Lord has shown me will take place just before the close of probation. Mm -hmm. Every uncool thing will be demonstrated. They'll be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. Don't forget that. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. Stimulant. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. It's wow. a what, Hillary? It's a stimulant. It's a what again? Stimulant. Their minds become how? So what? Confused. That means uh, we may say we Seventh-day Adventists are not Babylon. But if you bring the music from Babylon. Wow. You finish it. It says back to the screen. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. Better never have the worship of God blended with music wow. than to use musical instruments to do the work which last January was represented to me would be brought into our camp meetings. Then we're told the truth for this time, the truth for this time, the three angels' messages, the truth for this time needs nothing of this kind in its work of converting souls. Hmm. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which, if conducted aright, might be a blessing, a stimulant. Do you see it? Yes. The powers of satanic agencies blend with the din and noise to have a carnival. And this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. When the camp meeting or the church service right. or the pathfinder meeting or the youth revival, you name it, when the camp meeting is ended, the good which ought to have been done and which might have been done by the presentation of sacred truth is not accomplished. They don't mix. Wow. They do not mix. No. Back to the screen. Those participating in the supposed revival receive impressions which lead them adrift. Hmm. Hillary, read that, that, that next sentence. They cannot tell what they formerly knew regarding Bible principles. Wow. No encouragement should be given to this kind of worship. They cannot what? They cannot tell what they formerly knew regarding Bible principles. So when you bring in this type of music, the carnival-like style of worship, it says you make your members ignorant spiritually right so while you're doing this oh friends listen while they're doing this in the mindset of church growth numerical more numbers in the church their members 
die spiritually. Right. They cannot tell what they formerly knew as Bible truth. How then can they stand when the mark of the beast is enforced? How That's can right. they stand? They're worse than when they first came in. How, how can they stand and remember God's promises when they encounter life's trials? How can they stand? You know, when drugs have an effect on the mind, that when someone is taking drugs, brain cells are destroyed. Well, there has been research conducted that when this type of music with the loud drums and so on and so forth and these beats and everything uh, are, are taken in, that the brain cells are damaged. And so I, we can really see, even from a scientific perspective, that this is so, that you are not going to be able to tell what you formerly knew. So you're becoming dumb, as it were, to spiritual things. And it's, it's very unfortunate because while we should be at this time unlearning the principles of Babylon, this type of music, this type of worship is causing the members to unlearn Bible truths that they should know. They should be further advanced in Bible truth. No wonder. The saying goes, Seventh-day Adventists were known to be the people of the book, the Bible, the spirit of prophecy. Now, what are they known for? The majority of them. They can tell you about the singers in Babylon, though, and the movies in Babylon. And they can outdo some of the singers, And the too. sports and the Hollywood stars of Babylon. They know more of those things than spiritual things. We have to diagnose why there is a spiritual declension among us. And what our leaders won't tell us, by God's grace, we are going to add an addendum to their research. Go to 1 Kings chapter 12 with me. 1 Kings chapter 12. Everything you have just heard, it's going to be placed on scripture now. In 1 Kings 12, we are told about a king by the name of Jeroboam and another king by the name of Rehoboam. And everything that we are now seeing, the nominal Seventh-day Adventist churches are now doing in order to increase their church membership. Do you know that King Jeroboam did the same? Hmm. In other words, when King Jeroboam said, if I don't do some things here and there, the whole kingdom will go and follow Rehoboam. What Jeroboam implemented in Israel, it was for kingdom growth. And retention. It was for church growth. Mm -hmm. And look what he did. 1 Kings chapter 12 and verse 26. It mentions Jeroboam. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go and do sacrifice, so he was trying to keep and retain the members. Right. And he had the ten tribes we must mention. And how many tribes did Rehoboam have at this time? Two. Only two. He had ten. Right. Let's see what he did for kingdom growth, church growth, to retain church membership. It says... He implement what did he establish? Calf worship. Calf worship. Calf worship. He put one calf in Dan and one down there in Bethel. Calf worship. Look at this carefully. First Kings chapter 12, verse 28. He took counsel and made two calves of gold. Where else in scripture do we find God's people erecting calves for worship? Mm -hmm. Where Exod else? Exodus 32. We're going to come there. Well, look mm -hmm. now. First Kings chapter 12, verse number 29. One was placed in Bethel, the other in Dan. Verse number 30 says, the thing became a sin. Why? For the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. Verse 31. Verse 31 shows us now the ecumenical movement in principle. Mm -hmm. Well, it says he took counsel. So That's it. He probably took counsel. Ecumenical counsel. Of, that's right. It says he brought in men who were not supposed to even be priests. Wow. In the church, men of the lowest order. That's mm. verse 31. Jeroboam did this to increase church membership. But Jesus said, the Bible says, what Jeroboam did to increase church membership, 
It was a devil worship. Hold your place in 1 Kings 12. Go to 2 Chronicles with me. 2 Chronicles chapter 11. Let's read that. 2 Chronicles chapter 11. Mm. And look at verse number 13. It says, The Levites now, who were banned by Jeroboam, because they refused to carry on and support calf worship. So what's going to happen in the last days with some, a few ministers who are now in the conferences of Seventh-day Adventism? They are either going to go along with the modern revival, apostasies, right. or take their stand for, for the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. Correct. Their principles. And what will the modern day Jeroboams do? Marginalize them, ban them. We will come to that. Look at verse number 14. And the Levites now left their suburbs. And of course, they left uh, Jeroboam. Mm -hmm. And verse number 15 says, And he, Jeroboam, ordained him priests for the high places, and for the devils, and for the calves which he had made. So this calf worship, and what went along with calf worship, that Jeroboam implemented, for the purpose of kingdom growth, church membership, the Bible says it was a devil worship. Right. Now, what went along with calf worship? Tell us. Well, if we go to Exodus 32, we can clearly see. But just to reference, uh, there was jewelry wearing, the bedlam of noise, the dancing, the shouting, the carnival-like service, the nakedness, the eating, the drinking, the revelry, you name it, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the things... The large churches within our metropolitan areas, the urban churches, are now implementing in the churches, saying we do this for church growth. You know, friends, I was listening to uh, someone sent me a link in my email saying, Pastor, this is a meeting that happened a few, a few uh, days ago in the northeastern states of America when some, some leaders came together and they brought in the midst one of their pastors. And they said, this pastor is now our model because he has grown his church 300% fold. 300 fold. Hmm. He has grown his church. And do you know what he implemented? These very same principles. Catholic. No standards in the church. People wear anything to church, dress down Sabbaths, dress right. down Sabbaths. When the pastors dress down and come dress down, where in the Bible could you find a priest of the tribe of Levi dressing down? Nowhere. It's dressing down Sabbaths? What is that? Where do we find that in Scripture? Right. All Not right. There. And now they'll come to church and go to the go to the parks and play basketball and call that socializing to win souls wow. and the man's church is bursting at its seams as they would say right a boom in his churches and now they're saying this pastor i was listening for the one giving the report to say the pastor's name but he did not in his sermon, giving his testimony back at his church. Mm -hmm. And I said, look at what's happening. Right. And they call that church growth. Go with me. Exodus 32. Yes. They call this church growth. Right. And it may be church growth numerically, as we said before, but numerical growth does not mean spiritual growth. These people are being converted to the world, as the quote said from the great controversy. Look at verse, before. amen. Look at verse mm -hmm. number two. What were the women and the men wearing in the church there? The earrings, earrings. The jewelry. Do you realize what's happening among our churches today? You see, right. friends, worldliness, no standard. But you see officers, church officers holding positions, and they have they're decked out with jewelry. If they're walking on the street with, with someone that's not a Seventh-day Adventist, you know, somebody would not be able to tell no which one what no distinction no and distinction. i'm brought back to the quotation from volume one you know where 
these Adventists are marching in the broad road, but they have on their shirts, dead to the world, the end of all things is at hand. But be ye in, also ready. Yes. But they were in the, in the broad road. way, yet professed to be of the number traveling on the narrow way. And those around them would say, there is no distinction no between distinction. us. We are alike. Right. We dress, we talk, and we act alike. Volume 1, 128. Wow. And First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says, For you are a chosen, chosen generation, generation. Right. a royal priesthood, mm -hmm. a holy nation, a what now? Peculiar people. To show forth the praises of him who, who has called, called you out. out of out, out of darkness, into his one. His marvelous light. And friends, it's not by accident years ago. We know Seventh-day Adventists do not wear jewelry. When bands we don't wear, when rings we don't wear, earrings we don't wear, you pearls, we don't wear those things. Mm -hmm. And yet we have seen all of a sudden pastors have put on wedding bands and wedding rings. What's happening among us? Spiritual declension. Skip one down. Falling to away. verse number verse number five and they call this a feast to god worship mm -hmm. verse number four it was a uh, image worship wow so this leads to god's people worshiping the image of the calf or the image of the of the beast, beast. Wow. look at verse number six it says they rose up early on the morrow and offered what burnt offerings peace offerings the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play is mm. anything wrong with eating and drinking no so why would god mention that they were eating and drinking well for one they were carrying it to excess they were gluttonous but number two they were also partaking of things that god expressly forbade things sacrificed to idols intemperance yes. rising up to play i went to Oakwood. i saw what happened on sabbath nights want to sunset i saw what happened when intramurals came around comp competition basketball tournaments and the the wordlings from uah and from a and m and from a and m would come on the campus of oakwood blaring blasting their music and smoking and dressing like like vagabonds yeah i said it vagabonds yes i said that and we have uh, young people longing and lusting after that they were all down at the skating rink where they were playing worldly music exactly and, and who were also there the professors yeah they were there the professors and yet we are wondering now why is there student enrollment declension at oakwood university puc um andrews and the rest why god doth not now work to bring many sincere ones to those churches and those schools is it providential it is let's get to the root and lay the axe at the root you know it says rose up to play but that's not only talking about the sports because if we go back to patriarchs and prophets she testimony yes and mm -hmm. go ahead go ahead go ahead no give the reference no, no, I, go ahead, go yeah ahead. i was just going to say it also references um licentiousness gross licentiousness orgies um and that's what's taking place even in within seventh day adventism you have this lgbt movement that's making its way and if you listen keenly they will say the reason why we are for the lgbt movement let them become members so why do they push this movement church growth wow we are seeing it now and you can and see we're it. seeing mm. orgy testimonies to ministers page 99 Paragraph three, this rising up to play, we're told it was oranges. Wow. Go ahead. I was just going to say, when you think about, we talked about the exciting music with the drums and so on, but also they have this sensual environment, the dimming of the lights. They have this uh, music that arouses the base passions. And so the environment that these uh, attendees are exposed to, it really uh, is giving reigns to the lower passions i don't know where they get this idea from when they're playing when they were playing basketball at the skating ring and they're when someone does something very good on the court they come they come around as their teammate and pat the person on their butt all of those things tend to licentious acts immorality 
Even the dress, when you think about it, I mean, it's just Look flesh at this. exposed everywhere. It says here, just the whole environment. Exactly. Verse number 17. They brought in the worldly music. Verse 18, the worldly music. Verse 19, the dancing. And skip on down to verse 25, the people were naked. And as we look at our churches now, why is there a membership declension? The Lord doth not now work to bring his sincere wants into these churches. That's why many are staying home. That's why many are attending home churches. Why? Because they realize we do not belong in these churches. And they are doing this to say church growth. But how many lost their lives? Wow. In Exodus 32, how many lost their lives there? 3, in verse, how many? 3,000. In verse number 28, 3,000. Mm. Only counting men. 3,000 right. men lost their lives. What about the women who are normally uh, more in number? And the young people who are normally more in number. Right. Souls lost their lives. So I'm so sorry for you critics who love to say, there you go. Pointing finger at the church. Well, God says the axe must be laid at the root. And this is a life and a death matter because if we're caught up in this calf worship and the things that go along with it, we are going to lose our lives spiritually and we're going to lose out on eternal life. So it's a life and death matter. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 12 with me. 1 Kings chapter 12. God's word says this in 1 Kings chapter 12. Here is Jeroboam. Do you know what Jeroboam did next? In order to increase kingdom growth, membership, that nobody would leave and go to the other churches? It says in verse number 32 through verse 33 that Jeroboam established a day of worship mm. that God did not instruct Israel to do. So in the application for us, what day did God give us for the day of worship? The seventh day Sabbath. So what would be the application of this Sunday worship? Sunday Do worship. we see ministers today? Yes, yes. And calf worship is always associated with sun worship, Baal, the sun god. And so we can see that. But yeah, we do see it today. We saw it in Huntsville, Alabama. All right, here it is in mm -hmm. Huntsville, Alabama. Here it is on Spectrum uh, headline. This is Pastor Deblier Snail, Huntsville, First Seventh-day Adventist Church to offer what? Sunday services. Sunday services. And he was the same one that said uh, that the mark of the beast is not Sunday worship. So, of course, he would say that. He said it's simply just lawlessness. So they're doing this in the name of what? Church growth. Right. And they were taking pictures. Look. This, this pastor was baptized as a result of our Sunday keeping right. services. But what does God say? He doth not now work to bring many of his people into those churches. Why? They will be corrupted. And not only devil or snail, but what about um, Damascus Road Church? And that's a church that used to be a Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath-keeping church. But by and by, they were connected with Willow Creek. And by and by, they became, and even to this day, Damascus Road Church is a non-denominational Sunday-keeping church. And they even will tell you their history of coming from or coming away from Seventh-day Adventism to now being a Sunday-keeping church. And not only those two, but what about the um, Alex Bryan from... Uh, um, one project and Walla Walla right university church there yeah you see I believe in uh, Georgia he had a there was a, another former Seventh-day Adventist church and to this day it's now also a non-denominational uh, Sunday keeping church friend I want to ask you a question if you go back and think about the account in Exodus 32 between Aaron and Moses who did the people like more who did they prefer which one Aaron. why do you say Aaron you see why 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 Aaron you see because Aaron as you said allow them gave them what they wanted you see he was a men pleaser so now what what would they have done to Moses 
stoned him, killed him. So in the application, the pastors who allowed the false revival to take place in the churches, they are the ones being commended. Right. They're the ones being uh, applauded. And the ones who are preaching are thus said the Lord. The ones who are preaching the everlasting gospel, they're the ones being marginalized. Look at the screen here. Here we have a prime example of this. This is Adventist Review, August 2015. Bill Knott, the editor and executive publisher of Adventist Review, says those who don't want to go along with our agenda in the North American division, they must now be marginalized. Right. If you don't want to give in to the women's ordination movement, you must be marginalized. And once they take that stand, the next stand is, if you do not go along with the LGBT movement, yeah. you must also be one. Marginalized. But I want to say something about Jeroboam too, you know, and this marginaliz marginalization. Because in, at, right after he established this feast day, if you look at, at chapter 13, the prophet came to Jeroboam and he cried out against the altar. He was crying out against the apostasy that Jeroboam had brought in. And what did Jeroboam say? Seize him. So he was ready to persecute the prophet, persecute the one who was pointing out his apostasy, his error. And Praise he, the Lord. And he pointed, you know, for the Praise people God. to seize him. And Praise God him. providentially, you know, prevented so are that. Are you saying, just for emphasis, Hillary, that mm -hmm. Jeroboam, was trying to marginalize the prophet sent by Absolutely. God? Absolutely, he was. Wow. Yep. As he, Jeroboam, established calf worship and what went along with calf worship for kingdom growth? Yes. Yep. Are you saying it's coming again? Uh, definitely. It's, it's here. Are you saying it's here? It is here. And friends? It is here. Go back to Second Chronicles with me. Second Chronicles chapter 11. Father in heaven, give us more understanding. Because, friends, if we don't understand that we are in a crisis as a church and see that there is a spiritual crisis, why? The church membership is declining. The student enrollment is also declining. How on earth would we ever appreciate the remedies? Look at Second Chronicles chapter 11 with me. And I want you to notice verse 13 and verse number, through verse number 17. At this time, where was true worship? Was true worship among the ten tribes with Jeroboam? No. Or among Rehoboam for the three years? Uh, the three years in the two tribes. Where was the true worship? With, with Rehoboam. With Rehoboam. With the small group. Among the small mm -hmm. group. A small group. So now... Which group do you think people would have thought to say God's spirit was moving among Jeroboam's ten tribes or among Rehoboam's two tribes? Among Jeroboam. Right. Because they saw the number. And what we're driving home today, friends, and I want you to write this down. We began by looking at numerical declension in the churches mm -hmm. of Babylon, right? And the numerical declension of church membership among Seventh-day Adventists. And the numerical declension of student enrollment among Seventh-day Adventist schools. But here's the point. Don't miss it. We cannot now expect a great influx of people into our churches, whether it's conference or self-supporting this side of the National Sunday Law. No, you cannot expect it. Hear me carefully. Because those, let me repeat, we cannot now expect a large number of people entering our churches. Self-supporting churches, home churches. Do you know why? Because it is now the straight testimony must be preached. Mm. It is now the Laodicean message of chapter 3 of Revelation 14 through 21, 22 must be preached. 
And when the straight testimony is proclaimed, what will be the end result? The shaking among God's people. A shaking and a sifting. Mm -hmm. Let that sink in. So write down early writings, page 270. We are told, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and lead him to exalt the, the pure standard and to pour forth the straight truth. Some I saw, they would not bear the straight testimony. They would rise up against mm. it and those who preached it. And this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So this side of the Sunday law, before the mark of the beast is enforced, don't you expect a great number of people entering our self-supporting churches, entering our home churches. Why? Because it's now we must preach what? The, the everlasting gospel. Mm -hmm. The straight testimony. And what will it do and bring? Cause a shaking. It will bring a shaking and a sifting. Is that in scripture? Yes, it is. We, we find it in John 6. Well, and let's this, go there. This was right before Christ uh, was crucified, right before the crisis in Christ's day. And when his message became more pointed, you more mean straight, before the cross, before the crisis, you mean before church and state came and captured him. Yes. You mean before the options were given Christ, Christ. or Barabbas? Yes. Yes. A shaking took place. A shaking took A place. A sifting took place. Yes. And this was this was not even among the nominal, uh, the nominal church exactly. of that day. Exactly. This was among those that called themselves disciples. The followers. Right. In John, go there. John chapter 6. This side of the Sunday law crisis. So most of us who are saying, oh, not many people attend here. God's spirit must not be here. Look at those churches in the conference. A lot of people. God must be over there. Not now, my friends. Watch. John chapter 6, Christ laid out the present truth, the testing truth in John 6. Mm -hmm. And look at verse number 59. Where was he? These things said he where? In the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Mm -hmm. So the straight testimony went to those in, Ca in Capernaum in the synagogue. It also went to his closest followers, both groups. Right. Look now. At verse number 60, they said, many therefore of whom? His disciples. This is not, this is not Caiaphas. No. This is not those in the synagogues who had rejected him. These are those who are following him. Right. This could also represent the 5,000 he just, just fed. fed. Right. And they were following him just for fishes and loaves, but not for hard conversion. This is a hard saying. Wow. We can okay, handle this. It. Mm. We don't want to hear the hard saying, the straight testimony. And verse number 66 says, Hillary, go ahead. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Was there a sifting? Oh, yes. And we're told in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 392, paragraph 2, this was one of the times of purging. Wow. Purging. And verse number 67 through verse number 69, Christ asked the question, will you also go? Hmm. He turned to who we can call his closest followers. That's right. The 12. Not Herod. No. Not Caiaphas. No. The 12. Will you also go? Were they tested? They were tested. And they endured this test. But the thing is... They were tested a little closer. They were tested closer because in John 6, Judas was still among them. He didn't go away with these many disciples that left Christ. But yet, he was sifted out. Yet, all of the disciples at one point forsook Christ. So, friends, hear me again. Note this point. Our objective, even though we began by showing numerical growth declining in Babylon, those who are liberal, those who are nominal and numerical, bodily, 
growth in Babylon by those who are orthodox, those who preach doctrines, those who say we must convert the world. And we looked within Adventism and we saw a numerical uh, decline among the churches, especially in North America, not excluding elsewhere. And a numerical decline in student enrollment in our schools. Also, we showed a spiritual decline among our churches, the people, among our students. Our objective is not numerical growth. Amen. Write that down. Amen. Safe to Surf International. It doesn't matter how many folks attend Safe to Surf Local. It doesn't matter how many folks attend our meetings. It doesn't matter how many folks attend your home church and you pastors that we network with. It doesn't matter how many folks attend your local self-supporting churches. Our primary objective should not be numerical growth. No, it's spiritual growth. Amen. With the few that you have. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, as we do evangelism, and our focus is just sowing seeds, don't go with the primary intention to say we're going to win souls. We are going to sow some seeds. Different approach. We're going to persuade people to accept Christ's truth. We're going to water seeds. Now, if growth comes by God's grace, yes. And of course, when we fish, we, ex we expect to catch fishes. We know that. Right. But our objective is not numerical growth. Why? If that's your primary objective, you may very well compromise to keep numbers. Mm. But if your focus is standards, Bible standards, then guess what? If you stand and people walk away and don't come back, you will never tremble and buckle and compromise. You will stand though the heavens fall. Amen. You will cause sin by its right name. So again, our focus must be spiritual growth. Now, if souls come along as a result, praise God. But even so, we still, we still cannot be happy and rejoice. Why? The final shaking has not yet come. You know, as you just said that, my mind went to Matthew 21 with the triumphal entry. When Christ was riding in, you know, this was the beginning of the end, as it were. Christ were, you know, riding in and the people were exclaiming, Hosanna, Hosanna. They were waving palm branches and so on and so forth. And so many people were following him. But so on Sunday. Yes. So on Sunday, Mercy. on Sunday, they cried, Hosanna to the king. And on Friday, they cried, crucify him. Right. Think about that, friends. You had children, young people, disciples, families, parents, siblings, elders, Hosanna to the king. On Sunday, Hosanna to the king. And by Friday, crucify wow. him. And call, the same ones that called for Barabbas. Mm. Let's close. Go to John chapter 12 and then we'll take your questions. If you want to send in your questions, your comments, do so on Twitter. Hashtag STS Live. Hashtag STS Live. Go to John chapter 12 with me. Oh, friends, that's the focus here. Even as we focus on spiritual uh, growth, growing ourselves in the Lord, our families, our neighbors, introducing them to present truth, just sow seeds, water seeds. God gives the increase. And when these souls come, don't rejoice because you have a few baptisms. Don't rejoice because people come to your churches, come to your home for services. Because guess what? Friday hasn't come yet. Wow. On Sunday, Hosanna to the King. On Friday, they cried, crucify him. Friday is coming in the application church and state uniting to crucify him what cry will i make mm. what cry will you make john chapter 12 now we're going to come full circle and close so we began with this article here we close right here which showed look at the screen again headline liberal churches in decline while orthodox ones grow 
over here. Now, friends, when I read this, I saw this one thing, that God is now preparing people to receive the loud cry Amen. of the third angel. Amen. Again, listen again to the article. People in Babylon, in this research, are now saying, we are fed up with a diluted message. We want standards. We want, in their own way, we want present truth. And guess what? God would not now bring them. Not yet. On the other side of the mark of the beast, he's going to bring them in. God. And when I saw this article, I was jumping for joy. Why? The end is near. Let it sink in. The end is near. When people are now saying, in Babylon, right. we want standards. We want Bible doctrines. Right. We want godliness. prophecy. Mm -hmm. We want godliness. Friends, it shows God is now getting ready the other sheep. His people to come out. Oh, friends. Yes. Oh, friends. Oh, Praise friends. God. Revelation 18. <laughs> have to jump for joy he's now getting them ready and this brought my mind back i was then talking to hillary i said hillary does this not remind you of john 12 who came to ask to see jesus just before the crucifixion the greeks and what did they say we would see jesus they Praise said God. we would see jesus mm -hmm. friends this is in the context of john 12 when Christ just raised Lazarus. In John chapter 12, God's professed people marginalized Lazarus. Right. Marginalized Nicodemus. Marginalized Jesus. Planning now to kill Jesus. And to kill Lazarus too. In this context. Yes. Mm -hmm. Not the people of God, the Jews. The Greeks came and said, we would see Jesus. Wow. We want to see Jesus. We want present truth. We want the word. We want the truth, the way, the life. We would see Jesus. Amen. Just as the article. That's what I see. And mm -hmm. what did Christ do and say when the disciples came to him and said, Master, there are some, listen to me carefully, there are some Grecians who said, we want to know the truth. Mm. There are some people from the outskirts, from outside these walls of Jerusalem, who are now saying, we want to see the word. That's right. We want to see the man who can heal, the man who can give victory, the man who can raise the dead, not on the physical dead, but the spiritual Amen. dead, the man who raised Lazarus, who was dead four days. He was stink in the tomb. The man who raised one who was corrupted in body because of death. The one who told a woman, go and sin no more. Amen. The only one who can forgive sin. The one who told a man in John chapter 5, go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The one who can give victory over sin. Amen. The one who claims to be the Messiah. The one who claims to be the I am. Amen. The one who is our Savior. We want that word. We want to see Jesus. You know, as beautiful as that is, and it's, it's powerful. You know, it's also bittersweet because you see here almost like uh, these Greeks are replacing those of God's professed people who uh, rejected him and are now plotting to kill him. It's like you see some going out while you see others so hungry to receive him. And just as we, what we have been showing, like in Seventh-day Adventism, with people leaving, you know, the truth, many of them leaving for worldly reasons and to go join with the world. But now you see people in the world are ready to receive the three angels' message while God's people are, you know, rejecting it. This is the most exciting part of the whole study. And that's why, as 2016 is coming to an end, and by God's grace, we all may and will live to see 2017. We have to make it a year of aggressive evangelism. Amen. 
Because souls are ready. They are waiting. As Christ said to his disciples in John chapter, uh, chapter f when he spoke with the woman at the well. Four. John chapter 4. Mm -hmm. Don't say four months and then cometh harvest. Right. Disciples look. The field is what? Right. Right. Ready for it's harvest. white. It's ready to be harvested. This, this one, oh, Dwayne, put it back on the screen. This one report gives me encouragement. Should give us encouragement. Safe to serve local and international. It's time to launch out in the field. Last Sunday, last Sunday, we were at Lake Eola, right? As we were evangelizing using music as the tool how many souls were just taking those bags tears came to my eyes and most of them represent the greeks mm -hmm. and these greeks did not come in at that point they were being brought in they came in on pentecost but when pentecost yes. came amen Hillary, yes and Pentecost came after which great event? After the crucifixion. When church and state right. united. So these Greeks represent those who will come in after, friends. Under the loud cry oh. message. Let mm -hmm. me close. The Desire of Ages, page 621. I'm just going to bounce around here. It says here, when Christ heard the eager request, we would see Jesus. John 12, verse 20 onward. He says... The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And then we are told on page 622 that they represented a group who would come in after his resurrection. I won't spend much time here. Let's close. John chapter 12, friends. Souls are coming in. Now, even though we did not deal with more principles on the remedies, you got enough to start you off, to start being well spiritually and stay away from atmosphere where you, your mind and the mind of your children will be corrupted. Look at John 12. We close right here. When Christ saw and heard the Jews saying, we would see Jesus, mm -hmm. the next thing Christ said was, the time is come. The Son of Man must be what? Glorified. Oh, friends. Oh, friends. Oh, friends. When mm -hmm. Christ heard, people in the world were saying, we want the word. We want truth. The next words from Christ was, hear me now. He said, the Son of Man must not be glorified. We are told Christ walked out to give the Greeks an interview in the desire of ages, page 621 and 622. Because Christ knew they would see him on the cross. Right. And they would be puzzled, how is it he's on the cross? And I understood the application. The cross typifies what great event? Yes, the mark Lord. of the beast. Mm -hmm. So when did Christ prepare the Greeks? Wow. For the crucifixion. Before. 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 Oh, my friends. So when, oh, can you see it now? Oh, yes. So when, oh, I'm telling you. So when must we go to the world? The Greeks, as it were. Those in Babylon. To get them ready for the Sunday law crisis when Bible-believing Christians are going to be persecuted. Right now. Now. It is now. It is now that we must give them an interview. It's the very words in the book, The Desire of Ages, page 621 and 622. This is why I tell it to the world. We go out into the communities. And as we are sharing the gospel, what is the medium that we use? Interviews. Amen. Interviews. So what we're doing, safe to serve, don't become discouraged. It says Christ went out and gave them an interview. That's, that's the desire of ages. Page 622, paragraph 1, the chapter entitled, In the Outer Court. Mm. It's time to give people interviews, educating them for the coming crisis. Do you know how many people laugh and say, look at what those young people are doing in the field? Mocking, not knowing it's heaven sent. Okay, friends, 
Christ could say in John 12 and verse number 23. And Jesus, he said, the hour is come. That what, friends? The Son of the Man, man should, should glorified. be glorified. What does that remind you of? The Son of Man should be glorified. The first angel's message. Angel's mm -hmm. message. Fear God and, give and what? Glory. Give glory to him. Do you see why, say to serve, we spent so much time with those interviews? And we began, we switched, we transitioned, not only using current events, but also giving interviews and sharing Bible the principles study. of the first angel's message. Mm -hmm. We did fear God and did what? Giving him glory. As we see the world saying, we want Bible truth. Christ then said, it's time for the Son of wow. Man to be what? To be glorified. glorified. And in mm -hmm. John chapter 17, verse 1, how was Christ glorified? He said, Father, glorify me so I can and glorify, glorify thee. you. The only way to glorify Christ is to have Jesus in us. Amen. As he said, Father, I can only glorify you if you are in me. This must be our prayer, my Amen. friends. Christ in you, the hope, the hope of, of glory. glory. Amen. Oh, friends, what more can be said? If you missed those Bible studies, go back and watch those, those studies. Let's move here. Let's close here. Again, I see some comments here on Twitter. We're going to close very quickly. We don't want to draw it out. If you want to send in your comments and your questions, go to Twitter, S, hashtag STS Live. Here we have uh, uh, four sewer judgments sent in his uh, request stating identifying he says identifying 9-11 gave spiritual life or declension and then he goes on to say standard at the standard okay was left to trail in the dust as company after company from the Lord's army joined the foe. And this statement is also found in Testaments for the Church, Volume 8, page 41. Some from the world come in. Mm -hmm. will come in and take the place of those in the church. Why? Because those in the church are laying aside standards. Standards standards mm -hmm. thank you for sore judgments for your comments we have here leisha jordan just two quick words she shares i guess she's making reference to uh, why a spiritual declension is in our churches false bibles i guess the the gmo bibles the gmo mm -hmm. bibles mm -hmm. the bible, modifying bible translation meddling with god's original words mm -hmm. amen mm -hmm. the new version so-called version of the bible and here we have uh, um cheetah saying other get-togethers by congregation has is on halloween reason to give kids something to do so I guess they won't be upset. I guess here, uh, uh, Chita is making mention of the social gatherings. Right, on worldly holidays. Yes, yes, yes. For the sake of entertaining the children or giving the children something to do, which we should not give them worldliness or allow them to celebrate these holidays just to appease them. And then we have uh, Leonor Saldana. Leonor Saldana writes, again, thank you. That was Leisha? Yes, uh, Jordan. And now we have Leonor Saldana who writes, a group of us left an online ministry. This man claimed to be a pastor. Wow. We left. Why? We saw no fruits and we suffered spiritually. So, so an online pastor, so... What do you get from here? Well, not all 
uh, yeah, ministries exactly, that are uh, exactly. in the conference or professing to be self-supporting oh, oh, yeah. are allowing people to grow spiritually. And so it, it's not just because someone's in a home church or someone's in a self-supporting church that by default means it's a place where present truth or godliness or conversion or victory over sin, et cetera, is being um, taught and also manifested. It's not just about what the teaching is, mm -hmm. but what the fruit, the character of that you know, ministry yes. is. Yes, we have one more comment from Deborah Ibarra who writes, we actually, she writes, we actually study more at home than at church. Now that's sad. Then if that continues, then what is the purpose of the church? Well, the church should encourage people to, to study at home and also it should be a place of study as well. And so, but what I'm getting from this comment is that because of the lack of study at the church, it's, uh, you know, putting them in a position where they have to study more at home. But praise God for that, you know, because God wants each of us to be solidified in Bible truth. We have a comment here. Thank you. Who, who was that? That was uh, Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. And we have uh, a comment from Davis that says, Amen. He says, or he or she writes, we are waking up and need better food. It's time we are not being fed. It's time. And we are not being fed in the churches. We can only find Bible truth online. Very sad. Amen. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Davis. Thanks. You know, and very, very soon, we, we won't even have access to the online. So mm -hmm. we, we must thank God for the blessings that we now have. Right. And uh, be prepared to stand alone because that day is coming. That's right. That day is coming. Yea, mm -hmm. Christ will be with us, but we will have to stand and stand alone. We have one more comment here from Nicole Love, and we are going to close. Nicole Love, she writes, Exactly, Hillary. I came from a first day church yes that is so true i am a witness i wanted to stop dancing mm. and shouting but i couldn't stop moving i couldn't stop my body from moving yeah so it's the environment yeah Hillary. and something takes place also when when that type of music is played something takes place in the mind to where you know it bypasses the reasoning part of your brain and where a, a spirit for lack of a better term just takes over and sometimes you know you can't even control what is happening to your body much more what's happening in the mind so it's really uh, deleterious to be in those types of environments Okay, friends, I want to thank you for joining us this evening for our prophetic insights. Amen. Amen. And let's have a word of prayer at this time. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your inspiration, for allowing us to share your words of truth. Dear God, keep us faithful. We pray for every name that was mentioned for their conversion. Help us, dear God, to remain focused. Help us to be found faithful in these last days. All those who send in their comments and their questions, be with them as well. Bless those who have joined us online. Oh, dear God, help us to be a part of your number that you would use to evangelize the world in these last days. And while we preach unto others, Help us that we would not be a castaway. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. Every day, our prayer should be, we would see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. And we are told as we spend that thoughtful hour reflecting upon our Jesus, his great sacrifice, our confidence in him will be more constant. Our love for him will be quickened. And we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. Save us, we pray. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Okay, friends, I want to thank you for joining us this evening for 
this presentation. By God's grace, uh, join us on next Thursday at 7.30 p.m. and this coming Sabbath at 11.30 a.m. God bless and take care.